today uh, I wanted to teach on spiritual formation. Spiritual formation is one of my favorite uh, themes and concepts in seminary in Christianity. Um, and so I am going to teach on that today. Uh, what I'm going to do is give you an introduction to spiritual formation, and then we're going to get into silence and solitude with a understanding of the dark night of the soul. So um, let's get started. This is the introduction uh, to spiritual formation. So uh, I was a coach at one time, and when I spent time uh, as a coach, I uh, tried to make my uh, athletes better, better athletes. Uh, we did running, lifting, pushing the body to uh, past its stopping point so that it got faster, that it got stronger. Um, as a teacher, uh, when I was a teacher and coach, as a teacher, I spent time with my students to make them better students, teaching math concepts. Uh, practicing multiple problems, building on skills used. What about spiritual, uh, spiritually? What about uh, in your Christian walk? Is there anything that we can do to um, further our uh, Christian relationship, further our Christian life in uh, toward God more? So, uh, Spiritual formation is, according to Richard Foster, and that's the book that we use in this class, uh, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Um, it is the, talks about spiritual disciplines, and we'll kind of get into that. Another book that I use is Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life um, by uh, Donald Whitney. Um, I also use uh, a few other books, um, even by uh, Dallas Willard, uh, uh, Divine Conspiracy, um, and then different books from others as well. Uh, but Richard Foster says spiritual formation, uh, it talks about spiritual formation. The Christian idea of spiritual formation is very simply the formation and conformation and transformation of the human personality, body, mind, and spirit into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Uh, Dallas Willard says, it is the process of transformation of the innermost dimension of the human being, the heart, which is the same as the spirit or will. It is being formed, really transformed, in such a way that its natural expression comes to the deeds of Christ done in the power of Christ. Um, really, I want to know more than just what people think about spiritual formation. I want to be able to understand spiritual formation um, from a biblical perspective. Everything that we do, we need to have a biblical perspective of, um, of spiritual formation. And so what we have in 2 Peter 3, 8, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Uh, this is Second Peter 1, 3 through 7. You may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brother brotherly affection, with brotherly affection, with love. So spiritual formation is more than uh, something that we can do. It almost, to me, is the whole understanding of Christianity. Um, it's not a, just to get into heaven. We don't. We look sometimes as Christian Christianity as a, a free ticket out of hell or a free ticket into heaven. Um, there's more to Christianity than that. There's a relationship with God that we can have through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, if there's a way that I can get closer to God, if there's a way that I can get myself 
um, back, step myself back from who uh, my flesh, my fleshly desire wants to be into a more spiritual, into a more um, better understanding of who we are supposed to be in Christ. That's what I want to do. Um, another uh, another scripture that we have is Romans twelve one and two. Uh, when we see Romans twelve one and two, we are able to see that we aren't just supposed to stay still in Christianity. Uh, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, that's what we're trying to do in spiritual formation, and so in spiritual formation. Uh, the introduction to spiritual formation, we talk about spiritual disciplines. And so that's what we get to. That's what we get to the concept of, of, of what we want to do. Um, we're going to move forward to how we can... Uh, transform, grow into, and conform into Christ-likeness. Is there anything that we can do? What are the tools, practices, concepts that we can use to be spiritually formed? How can we make sure that they line up with Christian doctrine? And this is where we come into spiritual disciplines. There are many spiritual disciplines. Uh, Richard Foster talks around, uh, about 12. Uh, Whitney talks about uh, 10 to 12. Um, Dallas Willard talks around uh, talks about uh, maybe 12 to 16, um, but th sometimes they're all different. Sometimes they're all the same. Uh, for example, prayer, fasting, meditation, study. Those are what uh, Richard Foster calls inward disciplines. Um, you, you have to make sure that you are being transformed inside of you before you can change how you act. Um, because really what comes out of you is, and, and the way you act is what was inside of you. So you have to get closer to God by, by prayer. Everything we do, we do in prayer. We have to do more than just, um, uh, there has to be a desire to change, but there also has to be a practice of changing. So right now, what we're going to do is we're going to move forward to uh, solitude and silence. Now, solitude and silence is a, a discipline that uh, Richard Foster calls an outward discipline. So uh, the first disciplines that you need to do, uh, the first pr discipline you need to do is prayer, really. Um, but as you pray and as you continue to meditate on God's word and meditate on him, as you fast, as you study God, God's word, what you want to get to a point of is... Um, where those disciplines become an outward push. So inward, you're changing. Now you're going to change outwardly as well. Uh, you, a lot of people think that if you can change outwardly, that's the idea. That's the goal. No, you can't change. It doesn't matter what you do outwardly if you don't change inwardly. So when you change inwardly, when you give God more of yourself, more of your heart, more of your soul, more of your spirit, what happens is... Um, you're able to change who, how you act. Um, and that's something that all uh, Christians uh, should do. It's not just change uh, how you act. It's change who you are through Christ. And let not I, but Christ who lives in you push out into the world and to others. And so this is what we call outward discipline, solitude and silence. There are more, of course, outward disciplines. There's submission and service. There's simplicity. Um, 
There's uh, different things that you can do within each of these disciplines. But today we're going to talk about solitude and silence. The definitions for solitude and silence. Solitude is a state or situation in which you are alone, usually because you want to be. Silence is a lack of sound or noise, a situation, state, or period of time in which people do not talk, a situation or state in which someone does not talk about or answer questions about something. So those are the, the, the uh, textbook definitions of solitude and silence. Richard Foster says on page 96, loneliness is inner emptiness. Solitude is inner fulfillment. So being, uh, um, being in a state of solitude by yourself, away from others, is not lonely. Loneliness is empty. Solitude is inner fulfillment, but it's inner fulfillment, not from ourselves. When we talk about meditation, meditation is not emptiness. Meditation is not of this, you know, of ourselves. Meditation is meditating on God's word, meditating on who God is. We're not trying to get uh, a, uh, to know ourselves better or anything like that. What we're trying to do is to know God better. And so in solitude, we want to know God better. Though silence sometimes involves the absence of speech, it always involves the act of listening. Um, we're so uh, intrinsically motivated. We're so, uh, it, it's all about ourself. Um, and when we think of it as all about ourself, we think of, um, we put ourselves as the for, at the forefront and, and the main point. Um, but instead of thinking as silence as I'm not speaking, think of silence as I'm listening better to others. I'm listening better to God. Um, so instead of making it all about yourself, make it more about God and about others. So, Again, it, any discipline, anything you're taught, um, if it's not biblical, I'm not going to do it, really. Uh, to be safe with my students in seminary, I'm, I'm making everything biblical, and I'm talking about why it's biblical, and I'm talking about um, how it's biblical, and I'm talking about, I'm trying to teach them as well. Um, so it's never just something that I say we should do. Uh, everybody, let's do it, because I said it. Uh, I don't care. I don't care about if uh, another seminary professor says it. It, it, it has to be biblical. And so the biblical understanding of solitude is, but when you pray, go into your room, this is Matthew 6, 6, and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will, will reward you. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would, he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. More, Mark 135 and Luke 6, 12 are talking about Jesus, the uh, him withdrawing and being in solitude. Uh, uh, but every time he withdrew, he would be with God. He withdrew to pray, to be with his father. Psalm 46, 11 um, says, This is the whole thing that you have to see here. Uh, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake and with their surging, there is river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bows and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. When we look at Psalms 46, we see and hear and understand a beautiful, awesome uh, display of power about God. And yet we have to stand back and be still and know that he is God. And know we are not. That is a beautiful verse to explain solitude as well as silence. Um, my um, painting in the back is about being still and know that I am God. The biblical understanding of silence, Lamentations 3, 26. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Psalm 62, 5, for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. Habakkuk 2, 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent, keep silence before him. If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. There is biblical truth to silence and solitude. So why are we not in silence? Why are we not in solitude? Why are we not focusing more on God? Let's talk about positives of being silent. James 3, 1 through 12 says sorry James 3 1 through 12 says not many of you should become teachers my fellow believers because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly we all stumble in many ways anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check when we put bits into the mounts of horses to make them obey us we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example although they are so large and are driven by strong winds they are still steered by a very small rudder, whatever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. James uh, and it, it continues to talk about that. But really what, what James is saying is that there's uh, the smallest thing you can say can hurt or help someone. And what we, really what we really tend to do as humans is hurt more than help. Um, it's, it's almost opposite of what we say we are in silence for. But it's a major point of strength that can be found. It's the taming the tongue. Taming the tongue is, in fact, control. We as ministers need. We as Christians need. We need to be able to tame the tongue. Richard Foster says, One of the fruits of silence is the freedom to let God be our justifier. Think about that. Someone, uh, uh, you know, tells you something, uh, talks to you, maybe makes fun of you, maybe makes fun of uh, uh, what you believe, um, maybe makes fun of your church, makes fun of your family, makes fun of this or that. Maybe they, they don't do it on purpose. Maybe they're just, um, uh, you know, don't it, they don't understand what you're talking about. They, they say something they don't understand. And you want to not necessarily attack them, but you want to 
be able to defend yourself or defend what you're talking about or defend who you are or defend your church or defend why you are defending in such a uh, uh, argumentative uh, way, right? Why don't we let God be our voice? That's what silence does. We can always find something to nitpick. We can always find something to uh, go after people for, for whatever reason. But when we are allowing God to be our voice, it helps us tame our tongue. What is a better way of being a witness to the love of Christ than to not lash out. Instead of people who are coming against you, you get to uh, pray. This is a hard thing to do, uh, especially in politics. Uh, if someone doesn't uh, agree with you, uh, let me tell you why you're wrong, um, you know, in, in uh, different beliefs that we have. We, we set our life on different things. Instead of setting our life, on the, the, uh, setting our life in the kingdom of God, we, we put it on so many different things. What can we do but be silent when people are attacking us? The next thing we're going to talk about, and this is one of the reasons that, that I wanted to bring this up as the, the example of spiritual formation. There, there's so many different things that we cover. I, I love this course. Uh, I love this class. I, um, my doctorate is spiritual formation uh, within the church. Um, and and uh, instead of individual, it's, it's a corporate, uh, a, a, a communal spiritual formation so that's what I'm writing my doctrine on. I, I love spiritual formation. I think it is so important. Um, one of the reasons that I think this is so important, and one of the reasons I picked sol silence and solitude is because of the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is um, – hold on real quick. The dark night of the soul um, is uh, a literary uh, classic written by St. John of the Cross, and I got a, a, a translation here. Um, he didn't write it in English, um, so I have a translation. Um, but the dark night of the soul is something that is um, – it's – it's something hard to comprehend. Uh, accept Jesus Christ into our life. We are able to see um, the beauty and the love and the greatness and the, the, the niceness of God. We're able to see how he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. We're able to see how he loves us so much that he said... Um, that he would say uh, uh, and give his life for us. Um, and so when we are able to, to when we are able to see the uh, beauty of God's love and, and the greatness of who he is. And, and also we, we are, we understand that he has saved us. There's, there's something that happens where we, we turn our life towards him and we are able to see he's, he's saved us from our, uh, from death and hell and the grave. He saved us from, from uh, uh, eternity of, of, of damnation, uh, eternity of, of life without him. Um, but, 
after a while, what happens is that um, the blessings that he gives us um, start to kind of fall away. And it's not because he's stopping and blessing us. It's because he's desiring us uh, to love him for more than just the blessing, for more than just because he saved us. Yes, that's a big deal. He saved our, our soul for eternity. But the kingdom of God is at hand right now. Um, loving God right now means more than just what I'm going to get after heaven. I mean, get after death, the heaven that I get. It means more right now. And so when we see and understand the dark night of the soul, it's almost like God is going away from us, but he's not. Okay. He will never leave us or forsake us. The purpose of the darkness is not to punish or afflict us. It is to set us free. It's almost like God is leaving us. It's almost like God is turning around from us. Um, because what happens is there's a sense of dryness or aloneness or lostness. Um, it, it leads to a, a feeling of a letdown and a sense of not getting through to God. First off, you can't snap out of it because what God is doing is he's bringing you through something. Okay. Um, he's backing up from you so that your love to him goes out further. So you're not loving him because he's blessing you. You're not loving him because he's healing you. You're not loving him because he's prospering you. You're not loving him because of everything that he's giving you. You're loving him for everything he is. Everything he is. It's more important than the blessings that he's giving you. It's more important than the, the, the prosperity that he's giving you. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter where you are in your life. I just want to follow God. And so God is saying, follow me. Even when there is darkness all around you, when you feel alone, even when... Um, you get bad news from the doctor. Even when your family's relationships are being destroyed, even when someone is coming against you in false allegations and false, you know, uh, saying bad things about you and, and you would love to defend yourself and everything like that. Even when all of that is happening, you are still seeking God. If you are continually continuing to truly seek God, then no, it is not a falling away, but a drawing away from distractions to God. So again, it's not that he's leaving. It's not that the feeling of his presence is gone. And what he's saying, what, what, what St. John of the Cross explains um, is uh, an, it's a specific idea. And that idea is that, um, Everything's falling away, so you're focused on God alone. Yes, we have jobs, and yes, we have school, and yes, we have families, and yes, we have you know, even churches. Yes, we have ministries. Yes, we have um, hurts. Uh, yes, we have pains. Yes, we have our heart broken. But in all of that, we are going closer to God. In uh, Isaiah 50, in Isaiah 50, verse 10, who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, Trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? Let the one who walks in the dark, 
who has no light trust in the name of the Lord. I got to tell you, life is like that sometimes. There's no light around you. You're just walking in darkness. Whether there's someone who has passed away, whether there's someone, uh, your life you think is on course and it is uprooted for whatever reason, and you are walking in darkness, that is the time where you trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God. That's what the dark night of the soul is. Where there's nowhere else to turn, nothing else to do, but to seek him, even in the middle of it all. I'm going to read another passage from... Um, it's actually in, uh, by C.S. Lewis, the screw tape letters. Uh, so the way that, that C.S. Lewis writes the, the screw tape letters is he writes it from the, the point of view of the enemy of God from demons, basically. And he's saying that, um, he's, he's, it's almost like a satirical, um, piece of literature that he wrote. And it's, it's funny, kind of interesting, uh, but there's one part in it where, again, he's talking as a enemy of God, right? So you have to read it from backwards. He said, um, and this is one of the main, uh, one of the main um, higher up demons telling a, a foot soldier demon about humanity. Okay, he says, you must have wondered why the enemy God does not make more use of his power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree he chooses and at any moment. But you now see that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which are the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. Merely to override a human will as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most migated degree would certainly do would be for him useless. He cannot ravish, he can only woo. For his ignoble idea is to eat the cake and have it. The creatures are to be one with him, but yet themselves merely to cancel them or assimilate them will not serve. Sooner or later he withdraws. If not in fact, at least from their conscious experience all supports and incentives. He leaves the creature, humans, to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the well alone duties which have lost all relish. He cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him, God, seems to have vanished and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. What C.S. Lewis is explaining there is when a human, when we look around us and see darkness, look around us and we can't see whether whether it's real or not we can't sense or feel god and yet we take the next step in following god think about that we can't see god we can't feel god um and yet we say okay i'm still following you. I'm still seeking you. I'm still in the darkness, groping to get to you. That is the dark night. And yet, and when dark night happens, it's, it's a devastating thing. But when it happens, there is a, on the other side of the dark night, there is a, a sense of peace. Because now there's no way that you can turn from him. 
there's no way you can you can walk away from him because you've been through the worst part and he's still there that's what christianity is guys that's what we're looking for it's not tiptoe through the tulips it's crawling through the mud and yet when we walk in darkness and have no light we trust in god even more there's nothing that anyone can tell us there's nothing that anything can uh, nothing that can happen that will change our view because we've been through it all john of the cross says in the dark night of the soul bright flows the river of god in the dark night of the soul bright flows the river of god so again the dark night of the soul is important it is a, a important thing that mostly every christian is going to go through um whether it's uh things happening around you where uh maybe it's um you know um a a dryness a, a season of god i'm trying to do this i'm keep walking i keep going i keep doing this and yet nothing's happening um god's still there you might not be able to feel him too much but god's still there and he wants you to continue to follow him now there's no there's no carrot at the end of the string there's no prize at the end of this there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow he's saying follow me because i am god we see it in job job comes out and um he has everything he ever wanted um the uh devil uh takes everything away from him uh, kills half his family uh, takes all his riches and his health he's left there to sit and to ponder um he cries out to god god doesn't um tell him why it happened god just says i'm god and you're not and job says that's good enough for me you are god and i'm going to love you that's what the dark night of the soul is it's such an important thing because we will all go through it and we need to be prepared for it and know that god is still god it's easy to follow god when all good things are happening but true love comes out when you still follow and love god when bad when darkness when you feel alone and you still follow god that's true love of god what are things that we can do to get ready what are things we can do to to practice solitude and silence there's practical applications for solitude and silence. Um so first off, uh So uh, a few practical applications that you can do. Uh one, you can take advantage of little solitudes. Um there's a book called Practicing the Presence of God um uh, written by a monk who um you were thinking well he's he can always practice the presence of god he's a monk but he actually he he did a lot of uh washing dishes and washing pots and pans and cleaning and stuff but everything he did he practiced the presence of god you can find little solitudes throughout your time yes you're very busy everyone's very busy okay one of the things my dad always said pastor rafael garcia he always uh told me is that never think of yourself as more busy than you are than others are right and so everyone is busy i understand that um you know if you're uh, if you want to be a student here at stark you're you're going to be a you know either full time or by bi, uh, bivocational uh minister 
You're going to have things you do in your church. There's going to be things you do at work, things you do at home. Yes, you are going to have, and then you're going to put school on top of that. There's many things that you're going to do. But in your busy schedule, in your busy time, find little solitudes, times where you can just go and be with God. Is it a drive? I'm driving from one place to the next. I'm going to turn off my radio and just pray and be with God. Are there times where that you can um, find or make a quiet place so that you can have a quiet place at your own home? In your, in your office, uh, in, in your classroom, uh, you know, uh, in your, your church, is there a place where you can go at, at the park? Is there a place where you can go to be alone with God? Find and make little solitudes. Take advantage of those times. Let God be our justifier. Yes, we want to defend ourselves. If that, if that person knew exactly what I meant when I said that, you know, it, they would love me so much and everything. No, 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 no. Say, I'm sorry. And let God be God. Let God be our justifier. In fact, if we allow God to be our justifier, he does a better job of justifying us than we justify ourselves. Well, why did you act like this? Well, let me tell you why. Well, why did you do this? Well, I'm going to tell you why I did this. Um, answer questions. Uh, in simplicity, uh, we learn how we are to make our word be our word. But also... Let God be our justifier. It's okay to, to let, allow people to think bad things about you when they're not true. Because the way you act is going to come out more. In silence, listen to the thunder of God's silence. Well, wh where do we get that from? Well, um, Elijah, um, after battling uh, the prophets of Baal and everything like that, he goes... Uh, he's wanted now. Uh, he, they want to kill him. He goes and he goes to sit in this uh, next to a mountain on top of a mountain and he hears uh, a fire and a thunderous quake and all this stuff. But the Lord was not in the fire, in the wind, in the, the thunderous quake. The Lord was in a still, small voice. The power of God is grand, and yet sometimes he talks to us in a still, small voice. If we are so loud all the time, it's hard for us to hear it. We, my son was talking about uh, radio waves and how you have to tune in to the radio. Um, you know, if you're going to listen to uh, your station, you have to find the station on the knob. Right, and then you you it, that picks up those radio waves. Sometimes we're all over the place when we really can just sit in silence and to his radio station and listen to God. Another thing, what happens is that uh, compassion for others rises in us. Why? Well, because when we understand people are lying about us and, and don't understand what we're doing, when people talk back about talk bad about others, um, you're like, oh, you know, I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to worry about that. I'm, I'm not going to hear what other people are saying about them because maybe they're lying about them. Maybe maybe they're better. Maybe they're missing uh, misinformed or uh, they don't understand them. Uh, so there's compassion that says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that person uh, stand for themselves. I'm not going to listen to that thing. Also, when you are in the dark and trusting God, you learn that maybe other people are, are in the dark and they need to trust God too. And so you're helping them trust God. You're, you're, you're guiding them to, help, to, to God. Um, now it's not just about how great we are. It's almost like it's all about God. They can be our justifier. God can be our justifier. 
we can let God be their justifier as well. More practical applications. Um, there is the vow of silence. Uh, you can make a vow of silence. Well, uh, uh, what we did um, in school is we would do that, whether it would be at lunch, we would just listen to people. They'd ask us questions, we would answer. Um, but most of the time it wasn't, I'm going to interject. I'm going to tell somebody they don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to sit back and listen. I'm going to pray as I'm, I'm listening. I'm going to, to uh, uh, focus on God um, while I'm by myself. If I'm doing a, a vow of silence by myself, if I'm uh, trying to um, listen for the still small voice of God, there's different things that you can do. There's actually, you can have a retreat. Um, and there's a few retreats around Corpus uh, and one next to Kingsville, outside of Kingsville. Um, it's, a, it's a Catholic retreat, um, but I've been there. It's, uh, and what they do is th there's no talking there. And so you, you know, turn off your phone. Uh, you uh, don't talk. You, you can walk and do uh, little trails and stuff like that. You can bring your Bible and read. You can sit in different chapels that they have, um, you know, uh, but there's no talking. It's just being with God. And I think the number one thing in all we do is pray. Pray, pray, and pray. At the very beginning of this, we want to pray. At the very end of this, we want to pray. In the middle of this, we want to pray. Be about prayer. Um, my uh, father, one time I asked him if he could uh, be my mentor. He's a pastor. He's been a pastor since the 80s. Um, he started our church that I'm at now, New Song Fellowship Church. Um, uh, he's actually the, uh, we call him the senior pastor, as I'm the, the pastor, but we call him the senior pastor uh, there. Uh, he still goes and visits people, and, and uh, every now and then he'll do a sermon. Um, but uh, I remember asking him when I was in seminary, he was the head senior pastor, uh, the pastor of the church, and I said, uh, Dad, can you help me understand God more? Mentor me. He came back and he told me, "Pray, pray more." He said, "That's uh, that's it. I'm I'm done mentoring you. What you need to do is pray more." Um, and that's everyone. Everyone needs to pray more. Everyone needs to seek God's face more. Everyone needs to be humbled, and to turn to Him in all we do. It's not good enough just to think that we're doing a discipline, pray. Um, the discipline of prayer, when we do these disciplines, uh, in class, what I ask you to do is I ask you to practice the discipline for a week, whatever it is. Um, and then afterwards, write a paper about how, what happened, what were the experience of it. Um, when we do something like that, it's, it's, it's not just, okay, I'm going to do silence and solitude. No, I'm going to do silence and solitude. I'm doing a vow of silence. I'm doing a retreat, uh, whatever, but I'm going to pray within it. I'm doing fasting. Okay, I'm going to fast on these uh, meals, but instead of just eating, instead of eating, I'm going to pray. Uh, so everything you do, uh, any type of discipline that you do, you are going to pray. Um, and so that's one of the main applications for silence and solitude. Be about prayer. Be about getting closer to God. Be about, um, even in the dark night of the soul, reaching out for God. The reason I love spiritual formation is because it's applicable. It's practical. You can go out and do these things. You're watching this right now. Go out and, and have a time of silence and solitude. Go out and have a time of, of, of focusing on God. Go out and have a time and, and tell everybody, I'm going to a place, uh, a place in my closet, uh, you know, somewhere where I'm going to pray and be with God, be alone with God. These are things that you can do. That's why Stark is so great, because we are able to, to 
give you classes like this where, you know, this is just spiritual formation of the introduction. Um, and so we're able to do, to have a place where we can go and be about God. In conclusion, silence and solitude allows us to love God. It frees us to love God and others because we're free from the bondage to people and our inner desires. Think about that. Silence and solitude is not, I want to get away from people because I can't stand them. It's, I'm going to get away from people because I love them. I want to be with people. Uh, Dietrich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, writes uh, about uh, life together in his book, Life Together. And if you don't know who Dietrich Bonhoeffer is, oh my gosh, what a, a great hero of our faith. Um, in uh, World War II Germany. Um, anyways, he writes about life together, and he says two things. One, if you love community, but you can't be by yourself, you're doing it wrong. And two, if you love to be by yourself, but you can't be in community, you're doing it wrong. You need to be able to be in community, and you need to be able to be by yourself. And so if you have a problem with being by yourself, Practice this discipline of solitude. If you have a problem uh, being with others, practice the discipline of solitude so that you can go into others, and so you can go into the community with others. That's where we want to be. That's where we're supposed to be as the church. The mission of the church is not you. The mission of the church is to uh, is the mission of God to go out to the world. Richard Foster says, you are welcome to come in and listen to God's speech in his wondrous, terrible, gentle, loving, all-embracing silence. You're welcome to come in, listen to God's speech in his wondrous, in his earth-shaking, uh, terrible, and is gentle, loving, all-embracing silence. That's the end of my notes, but this is what we're going to do. Uh, you thought you were done. No, this is our uh, what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, put, you're going to sit with me for three minutes of silence. Okay? Three minutes of silence. We're going to sit and just Focus on God. Now, if you're saying, okay, I heard his notes, I'm done with him. Uh, no, 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 don't be done with me. You're going to look at me, me and you, face to face for three minutes of silence. You can be in prayer. You can be in meditation with uh, God's word or, or God. But what we're going to do is we're not going to talk. We're just going to sit here. We're not going to scroll through Facebook. We're not going to uh, uh, look at the classes that are being offered because uh, spiritual formation will be offered in the fall. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, going to do that stuff. What we're going to do is, is look at and focus on God himself. All right? So let's pray in silence.
we're still in the middle of the silence, but what I wanted to tell you is that sometimes our, our minds can, can have thoughts run across them. Just try to get rid of them and focus on God. Just continue to focus on God. So let's continue to pray in silence. What, what I have is that that was around three minutes. I got to tell you, that was only three minutes. How, how, how exhausting was that silence? Wasn't there something that you wanted to do? Wasn't there something that you, you had to say, you know, uh, a cough, you know, something? Um, and yet when those things come up in the silence, you just give them to God right? Because it's not about the discipline. We're not worried about the discipline. We're worried about our relationship with God. We're worried about getting others closer to God. We're not worried that we're failing in the discipline because we'll fail in the discipline. And I think when we fail in the discipline, it teaches us more. So uh, I want to thank you for joining us in uh, this uh, just short uh, short lesson. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray for you. Um, what we do is in before class and at the end of class, we always pray. Um, and so I want to pray for you right now so that uh, you are um, able to understand and get the complete kind of uh, class. Now, this was a, a run through. Uh, usually our classes take around two hours, 30 minutes, and we have discussion in them. Um, we have uh, thoughts going back and forth. I have questions. People have uh, prayers. Um, and so we go through a, a lot in that time. Um, but uh, right now, let me pray for you. Let me pray for us. Let me pray for Stark College and Seminary and for the family and community of, of Stark. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for moving um, in uh, this world, Lord. For whatever reason that, that they have come to watch this video, Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name that you make it not just something that they, they watch, but something that they do, something that is um, transforming to them. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name, if they have an, a, a desire to learn more, that they, they uh, follow your will, follow your way, um, give us a call. Lord, help us at Start College Seminary to help others to bring others closer to you, to help others be ministers for you, Lord. Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name that you go into their house, into their uh, home, into their family, into their church, Lord, and be with them, Lord. And as even as we walk in the darkness, Lord, help us to trust you even more and to continue to walk following you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all you've done. We thank you for your salvation and your grace. We thank you for moving in our lives, Lord. I ask you in Jesus' name that you be with us today and every day. Bless us to your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Uh, again, I hope you had a, a, a little... Uh, you were able to get some knowledge from this. And uh, if you want more information, uh, let us know. Start college and seminary. Uh, we can uh, help you uh, get some classes. You can audit classes. You can get your uh, accredited bachelor's and master's um, certificate and diploma. Um, so just uh, let us know. God bless you. We love you. Um, and may... Uh,
God's face shine upon us all. Amen. Bye.